How you doing this evening, folks? I hope you're doing great. I hope you had a good day. Long weekend is approaching. Don't worry. Before you know it, it's going to be Friday. For those of you in the U.S., those of you in other parts of the world, we've got a holiday coming up. Long weekend. I know everyone's looking forward to it. Welcome to today's show. We're going to be rolling for about an hour, an hour and a half, thereabouts. And there'll be a short intermission break, about an hour's break, and then we'll come back and play you some music through the night with some PMBOK-related information. And we'll also be talking about our friends at headquarters and certain perspectives that they have to project management. Last night, I talked about the 20 tools, top 20 tools. I'll be talking about that again later on tonight. So let's get started with some music. Let me know how your day was. Chat into me, folks. Let me know what's up. You having a good Pembok day? Did you get your knowledge areas in? Let me know. going to be playing some live music for you. I don't know too many PMP trainers that play you some live music. You'll be amazed at what this little keyboard can do, folks. It looks small, but it's bad, I tell you that. that I play for you, in fact all the music I play for you is pretty much from this, believe it or not, most of it. Some of it I've got a bigger keyboard but for the most part anything I do live, you're going to see me with my Korg Mini. Thank you. 
I was saying that this is a lot more fun than reading the Pembok Guide. <laughs> I have to be honest, for the first time, I'll tell you something that I prefer to read in that book. are so small, <laughs> but hands like this is a bit tricky. Hey, I've got some really great news for you guys tonight. I know a lot of people have been saying that they want to come on board the course but they can't afford it. I've got a crazy deal for you guys tonight. Those of you who want to get on the course for an extended period of time, we've made some adjustments. So if you go to our site, crazyon.com, to purchase the course, PMP Exam Prep Camp, you'll find out that it's a lot less and you can actually sign up for multiple months. So in the next few days, there are going to be a series of changes, folks. You're going to see it roll out, and you know we're going to be there for you to help you to get this monkey. Oh, speaking of monkeys, you see who's behind me. Say hi, Pimpy. Hello. Is that all you're going to say? I'll be waiting for you. He said he'll be waiting for you on the exam. <laughs> all right. We've got Stormtrooper behind. Come here. How you doing, Stormtrooper? You want to say something to the lovely people out there? I've got my gear. Ready to take on the Rebels. <laughs> He's ready to take on the Rebels. Are you ready to take on the Pemba? All right, Stormtrooper, you stay there. Let's play a little bit more of this jam, and then we'll shift gears and go into the dark zone of the Pemba Guide. Some rock guitar coming up. It's 
gonna get a little bit distorted. Well, I call that one Pembok Drag. I don't know whether it's because the Pembok guy feels like a drag to some folks. I don't know why I called it that. It just popped into my head. I call it Pembok Drag. So how are you guys doing today? I hope you're doing great. And I hope your PMP studying, your project management, your business, whatever business you're into, I hope it's all going good. And I hope you're looking forward to the weekend because a weekend is actually an opportunity, folks. It's an opportunity to catch up on stuff with family, and it's also an opportunity to catch up on your studying. So I keep reminding you about studying because it takes a lot of energy to keep going for weeks. And if you prolong it, you've got to keep that momentum up, you know. You've got to keep on hammering out knowledge areas, process groups. I mean, it, it becomes tiring after a while, doesn't it? So best thing to do, folks, is to get it done quick, as quickly as possible, you know. That would be my two cents, get it done as quick as possible. Anyway, let's shift gears here, and let's take a look at the Parazion site. I'm going to be showing you how to get this course. So if you go to the site on the screen, it's Parazion.com. If you go to Parazion.com, you see three different curricula. The one you want to click on is the first one, the very first one. If you click on that one, it's going to take you to our page where we feature this course in a little bit more detail. Okay, And if you scroll down, you see that a month access has now been reduced from 349 to 175. It's only your buddy Phil that would do something that crazy. Something that crazy. You know, because a lot of people are saying they want to take the course. And I feel bad hearing them say, I want to take the course, but I can't afford it. I want to take the course, I can't afford it. So now we have made it so ridiculously affordable that even if you sit on the LMS for one month, folks, one month, just one, you're going to get a ton of value. If you scroll down and read all of the different bits and pieces, go to format, uh, scroll down and take a look at what's there. You can see we've got a link. Click here to view sample video. Click on that link just to get an idea. I know you've already seen lots of the course. I've shown you tons of it on YouTube. But if you click on that, it will take you to this page. You can see Emily is teaching Validate Scope in that one. 
and if you scroll down there's your buddy Phil looking like he's about eating a mouthful of ice cream or something I don't know what it what on earth he's doing there but anyway you can just click on the link and then you see what I'm talking about it's integration management just an overview but if you can play these in your browser see if you can play these the chances are that you're going to be able to watch everything without stress so we put this here as a sample for you so that you get a feel for how these videos are set we have get this over a hundred and something videos that are going to be accessible to people who sign up for the course and we're rolling it out gradually so right now people who sign up for the course they're going to be able to see every module that is a process so develop project charter is a process but it's a module you see what I'm saying so as opposed to it being some other courses where you go on to integration and you get lost somewhere in integration and you're like I don't even know how I got here I don't know where I am because it's so dense you know the, the PEMBOK guide is so dense that it makes sense to deliver it in bite-sized chunks folks and that that's really what we did in the delivery of, of the course in this format bite-sized chunks so that people are going to be able to digest it people aren't you know gonna have tummy upset because <laughs> I don't know what else to call it uh, I mean if you eat too much Pembok is good but if you eat too much and you don't let it digest you're gonna be in trouble you know that so that that's the trick to put it in bite-sized chunks bite-sized chunks that people can eat people can digest they're not gonna need you know any laxative sorry to be so graphic all right take a look at the screen here you can see I'm showing you what this course is made of how the course is broken down if you take a look at the screen right here you can see how it's broken down so though you see let's go to chapter 7 for example on cost so you see chapter 7 on cost so although you've got chapter 7 on cost you can expand that and inside that you have the bite-sized chunks bite-sized chunks of every process so if you wanted to just take a dose of estimate cost you can you don't have to watch the entire the whole entire four videos of cost you know you can just watch one and then move on to maybe something from risk for example you know so it's it's extremely accessible very easy to move around and it's very easy for you to take stock of where you are you know so that you don't get lost in the whole thing getting ready for the PMP exam can be daunting on its own then you pile on top of that a whole dollop of a, a knowledge area filled with so much that's not how to do it so the way we've broken it out as you can see here is for you to be able to move from process to process and when you're done with one process you could say that's I'm calling it it a day or you could go for some other adventure maybe in quality somewhere for example you know so all of this stuff like I said is accessible to you when you sign up go to praiseon.com or pmsucceed.com they both lead to the same place but you don't want to click on anything else other than the first option the first option is what you want to go for PMP exam prep camp 2018 that is going to be your course for this prep all right so I hope that tickles your fancy those of you who have been saying Phil I want to join but you know there's always a clause well hopefully we've gotten rid of that clause now and if you have any questions always send them in send them into the channel you know it might be a few days 
you know, maybe even a few weeks if I'm on the road before I get back. But those questions that you ask, you know, about the course or about the PMBOK guide, I will always get back to you on that, okay? So tonight, we're going to be listening to our programs as usual. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna start off with some of those programs. And then midway in between, I'm gonna come back, I'm gonna give you a quick lesson on a knowledge area. I'm not gonna tell you which one, but the trick is that it's a knowledge area that the PMI has considerably changed. So I'm gonna be doing that round about half past, coming on, it's 9.06 here, so at 9.30, I will be giving you that breakdown of a particular chapter in the PMBOK guide, giving you pointers that will help you as you study. So we're gonna shift gears here and go to some programs, and I look forward to seeing you when I come back later on. So just stick with us for a little bit, shift gears, get some programs rolling, and I'll play one more track for the night, live, after these programs we're gonna be listening to shortly. So thank you for joining. Don't forget any questions, any chats, chat them in, chat them in, chat them in, chat them in right now. Your buddy Phil is here to talk to you. Hey, it's not, you know, you know what communication is in the world of the PMI? You know, communication, for it to really be communication, it has to be a sender-receiver model. It's, it's not called a sender model. It's called a sender-receiver model. So if I'm sending a message, you can acknowledge that you heard feedback message. <laughs> it goes a long way, okay? I'll speak to you very soon. Later, Gator. When a well-known engineering firm decided to hire me on as a scheduler, little did I know the history that had happened before me, and little did I know the future that was before me. I started managing roughly 20 schedules on an engineering project that was sponsored by the Department of Defense and as a program controller on this project, my job was to make sure all of the schedules were updated very frequently. Now coming on board, I didn't really understand the history and why the schedule was so important to this particular major who was managing the project. It was as I began to work on the project or program, if you will, of 20 plus projects that I began to realize we weren't doing a very good job delivering what we promised. Have you ever worked on a project where your colleagues are not as sensitive to the schedule? It doesn't bother them if things slip. Well, I learned the hard way. When you promise the customer a particular timeline, you better make sure it's delivered. So my job was managing these schedules in Microsoft Project Server. I believe back in those days, Project Server had a totally different interface and it interlocked with the back end differently. But anyway, there was something called Project Web Access, I believe it was, and that would allow the customer log in and be able to see the foolery that you're up to, the, the buffoonery. Let's call it what it is. You promised you would give me this on this day. You haven't done it. What happened? And those were some of the questions we kept getting. Hey, Mr. M said he was going to do this wastewater treatment task. Why hasn't he done it? Why don't I see it as complete? Have you ever worked for a customer that knows about scheduling? It's quite a daunting task because before you can lie, they're five steps ahead of you. They're already next week and you're still in this week. Long story short, I began to realize that in schedule management, one had to be even more intentional than ever, especially when you're working with a very knowledgeable customer. And I can't blame the customer for being so time conscious. 
In the words of Thomas Akempis, he says, "Remember, the lost time does not return." And we lost quite a lot of time on that project. I tell you, we lost time so bad. Don't let me even go into it. It wasn't a pretty ending. Let me just put it that way: the ending wasn't very pretty. Benjamin Franklin says, "Waste neither time nor money, but make the best use of both." Needless to say, I don't think we did either very well, <laughs> and that's why I'm here today. That's why I'm not in that job anymore. But we're in schedule management now, and once upon a time the PMI used to call it time management. But in schedule management, this is where we intentionally plan how to schedule, and we also create the schedule step by step. And then we get to the point where the schedule has been developed, and then we need to get it authorized. We need to get that schedule locked down. We call that the schedule baseline. So the schedule baseline gets locked down, and our next step is to control the schedule to make sure that the team is marching to the beat of the project. Plan schedule management is the first process in the schedule knowledge area, and the goal of this process is to come up with a management plan, a schedule management plan that will be part of the project management plan. So this is going to determine the how you're going to manage schedule in your project. It's the process of establishing policies, procedures, documentation for planning, developing, managing, executing, and then controlling the project schedule. Most misfortunes are the results of misused time," says Napoleon Hill. We want to make sure we're using our time as wisely as we can, and one of the ways to assure that is to first of all decide how are we going to manage time on the project? How are we going to develop the schedule in the first place? Which software will we use to develop the schedule? How frequently should we meet to discuss the schedule? So on and so forth. The PMI spell out some very interesting trends and emerging practices in schedule management. Going into the world of agile, we have agile release planning, and we have the product backlog being spoken about. Definitely, for your exam, I would advise that you become familiar with how scheduling manifests in the world of agile. But let's move on to the very first process. Of schedule management is called plan schedule management. Plan schedule management is the first process in schedule management where we decide the how. How are we going to develop the schedule? What are the policies and procedures and documentation surrounding scheduling that we need to be aware of? And the key benefit of this is it guides the team, make sure that we've got some structure in place. And we've got direction about how the schedule will be developed and managed throughout the project, and this could be something that is performed in an iterative fashion, depending on the type of project you're working on. Be it iterative, be it incremental, change-driven, predictive, whatever it is, there is some measure of planning how to go about scheduling that is conducted at different points. So the first thing that we see here as an input is a no-brainer. It's the project charter. Why do we have the project charter here? Remember, it's got those milestones, high-level milestones, and it's also got related information that will influence how our schedule is developed. We also have two very important pieces that affect our schedule, and that is one. The scope management plan, because we first of all need to understand scope, and then comes schedule. Schedule doesn't come first; it's scope then schedule. So we have our scope management plan as a possible input, and we also have the development approach. Remember, I said if you're in the world of agile, it's going to be different. So your product development approach helps you understand how best to schedule. 
The next input is one of those we're used to seeing. Enterprise environmental factors, organizational culture, structure, team resource availability, also scheduling software. Remember PMIS, the Project Management Information System, having a system or not having a system could influence this process. So if there's scheduling software being used in the firm, well that needs to be considered as one of the potential inputs under EEFs here. Organizational process assets, historical information, existing formal and informal schedule development, policies and procedures for scheduling, templates and forms, stuff that you probably are aware of. We need to factor those in as well. Moving on to the tools and techniques, you know these expert judgment, expertise in the area of scheduling, how best to develop the schedule, the industry standards, the specific industry in which you're working or creating the deliverable for, that stuff could be an important input here. Data analysis. Well, data analysis is talked about in Appendix X6. Just take a look somewhere around page 686 or following and you'll see what types of sub techniques are listed under data analysis. As we go through this process, I would like you to take a day out and just go into the tools and techniques, zone into them, and understand at a high level data representation, data analysis, and so on. So here, the data analysis we're looking at is not limited to alternatives analysis. We're looking for alternatives for scheduling, scheduling methodology, should we combine various methods? Should we use a fully planned driven approach as well as something else? If we're hybridizing, some parts could have the schedule developed in a traditional way and other parts could have it developed in an agile fashion. Are we going to use rolling wave planning? What is the duration of waves? Are we going to plan in waves of quarters or are we going to do it every year? It really depends. So all this level of detail is stuff that we could be analyzing here in our alternatives analysis. Meetings, the meeting of the minds is a no-brainer. We get people together in meetings and make these decisions and have our schedule development workshops or what have you. So these meetings are where we begin to frame how we're going to put the schedule together. We might need to meet with the sponsor, particular team members that have a good idea of how this works. All of this has to be planned up front. Think about it. If you are putting together a list of activities, we don't just wake up in the morning and say, hey, let's get together and put a list of activities together, do we? We plan in advance. We will be having a meeting on XYZ date to do this. One of my clients would call that plan day, and on plan day, everyone knows what we're doing. We're fleshing out these schedule activities. It has to be planned, put on people's calendars, and only then is it successful. People you need are in the meeting, so on and so forth. All right, major tool and technique that we've talked about, data analysis. Let's move on to the outputs. Output, schedule management plan. People kind of see this as being strange, that... We are planning how to plan, but planning has to be intentional. You don't want to try this alone at home, project manager. On that project I told you about, we had certain project managers trying things alone. It wasn't good. You want the power of the team, right? So our major output is the schedule management plan that establishes how we're going to develop the schedule what the timeline would look like for the schedule development activities, how frequently are they going to be done, are we going to use a high-level milestone schedule, or are we going to use a broadly framed schedule going into deep detail. There was a project I once worked on, project I can't disclose at this point, but I'll tell you this, in the room we had 20,000 lines of schedule for this particular deliverable. 20,000 lines of schedule. That was a schedule that needed to be put in place for the nature of work being done. I remember one of my colleagues, Colin, telling me a story of how he developed a schedule for the nuclear industry 
and it was a nuclear plant shutdown and there were so many activities, thousands of activities, and some of these activities were a one second event. So depending on the nature of the project and the industry you're in, you may need to plan very, very detailed how you're going to carry out schedule activities and how deep you're going to go in terms of your itemization of tasks and so on. What kind of metrics are you going to use? Are you going to think about the weeks? You're going to think about weeks, months, days, years? How granular are you going to get? So part of what I expect you to be tested on on your exam is on page 182. When it comes to the schedule management plan, you need to know what is in it. And part of what is in it is the project schedule model development, release and iteration length, level of accuracy, units of measure, organizational procedures links, project schedule model maintenance, control thresholds, that's a big one, rules of performance measurement when we talk about earned value, how do we know what our SPI is or when is earned value claimed because that will affect our SPI and also reporting formats. All of that stuff is on page 182. My advice would be to know that cold for your exam. That is pretty much what I expect you to be tested on on your exam. The essence of the process and also the items that are part of the schedule management plan. And that concludes our plan schedule management process. Let's move on to the next one. Hello, welcome to today's show. How you doing today? Hope you're doing great. How is your PMP exam studying coming along? You know, you put so much time and effort into this thing, I need to ask you, how is it coming along? That's why I ask you what I ask you. I know how much time and effort and energy you put into this thing. Huge amount of effort. So I'm hoping that you've been using your resources really wisely, you know. Resources like time and money. It is extremely important, you know, to use your resources wisely. You know, speaking of resources, some folks spend thousands of dollars preparing for this exam, you know. after spending so much money, you really want to make sure that you're doing your part so that you don't have to spend it twice, you know. It's a big deal. Especially when $555 is not a piece of change you want to waste and spend every day on an exam. You want to do it one time, right? So my advice is, hunker down, do it good one time, so you don't have to do it again. I spent six months trying to get certified 
that's a lot of time and it took that long because I was really trying to absorb it but in addition I didn't do it the way I would have if I was doing it today I would have pumped some more resources into the mix definitely some more monetary resources although for me it turned out alright I taught myself a whole lot of stuff as I prepared and a lot of what I teach is as a result of what I studied and learned during that period so do what you need to do folks whatever you need to do do it Time and energy, do it. Effort, keep doing it. And don't drown alone. Basically, ask for help. You know, you've got this channel. We're here for you. We put out this stuff to help you. And if there's any other way we can help by answering questions, we want to do that for you. So why don't you go ahead and chat in. If you've been listening to us and you enjoy the programs and the shows, chat in and say, I'm enjoying it. What makes project management great is a question I asked earlier. And project management is made great not because of software tools, but the minds and the attitude of the people behind the tools. How did I ask that question? I asked the question because we were looking at the top 20 project management software options the top 20 according to the PMI And you know, if you really look at these top 21, they have a lot in common. It seems like the world is becoming very, very social media minded because lots of these tools, even though they are to manage projects in an organization, they incorporate a lot of social media functions. You're able to communicate and link up social media and you're managing projects. Times have changed and to be really honest, I can actually predict that organizations that do not have their ducks in a row to become more mobile more agile, more social media intense. Those organizations will fizzle out. Those software tools will begin to become obsolete. Check it out. That's what's going to happen. If you want to stay relevant in today's age, you got to get your social media mind in line with what's going on because very soon the millennial generation will be a key part of the business 
you know, they're not used to those dinosauric tools that people use. So something's got to give, right? That's the way I see it. Great project management is not great because of the software tools. It's the minds and the attitudes. The attitudes. Zig Ziglar said, it's your attitude. All right, my friends. It is now the top of the hour. And like I told you, we are going to be taking a look at a knowledge area. And the knowledge area we're going to be taking a look at is one that you encounter every day. Every day of the week. Well, yeah, every day of the week. No matter who you are, no matter where you are, you encounter this knowledge area, definitely. And not only do you encounter this knowledge area, you also decide, you make decisions that revolve around the crux of this knowledge area. I wonder if you know the knowledge area I'm talking about. Anyway, before we talk about the knowledge area, really quick here from one of my favorite books, 500 Clean Jokes. I'm going to tell you a few lessons learned of mine that kind of correspond to what's in the book. I don't know how many times you guys have been in a vehicle where you saw the bright lights flashing behind you. Have you ever been there? I have. And each time it happens, I have to come up with a more creative way <laughs> of getting out of whatever I'm in. I've been quite successful, to be honest, in, in, in getting, getting my way out of some of those. But anyway, this is 33 excuses given for breaking the speed limit. I'm only going to give you 10, and then we'll talk about the knowledge area. <laughs> First one is, I didn't realize it. I didn't realize I was going at 90 miles an hour. I was traveling with, I was traveling with the flow of traffic. <laughs> oh, dear. Well, here's the trick. If you're going at the flow of traffic, likelihood is you may not be caught, but someone might decide to make you a scapegoat. So be careful with that. You know, I've actually had that happen. I remember going up to um, the Indian reservation up in Flagstaff, and there's this not case in front of me, like going at like almost double my speed. But still, the officer decided to pull me over as well because he felt I was going too fast in addition to the, the person in front of me. So be careful with the flow of traffic. Number three, I was only passing someone. Not, not a good reason. My speedometer must be wrong or broken. <laughs> oh dear. But I had my cruise control set at such and such. Oh dear. Your radar must be wrong. That's the wrong thing to say to a cop, I tell you that. Running late for something. Oh, I'm on vacation, number eight. Or oh, number nine. I was trying to get, I was trying to get to a restroom. Can you can you imagine that one? And number ten. This is someone else's car. I'm not used to it. Fun and games. Anyway, you probably realize what I'm talking to you about today, folks, is risk management. Risk management is huge. It has gone through a little bit of a facelift in the sixth edition in that never before have you seen implement risk responses and never before have we been without, or at least to my latest recollection of it, without workarounds. Did you realize that workarounds isn't there anymore? <laughs> anyway, workarounds aren't there as a word in the PMBOK guide that I've discovered. Maybe you can do some research and find out if you can find the word workaround, but it's not there anymore. There's a little bit of controversy about that, so it's not there anymore. Anyway, in risk management, you need to get your bearings right about why you're doing what you're doing. That's what it's all about, folks. Why am I doing what I'm doing? And then 
you then understand how to do what the PMI is advising that you do. So plan risk management, this process is one in which we should sit down and have dialogue with the people, the people on the project, the people working the project, and the stakeholders. Now, different projects have different, you know, bandwidths of risks. But if you're working on a very changeable, very risky project, where change is almost bound to happen at the drop of a hat, it might be a good thing to consider, to consider upping your frequency of certain processes throughout project management, such as validate scope, you know, such as, how about doing an early validate scope, even before the deliverable comes out, like real, real early. That's the kind of thing you need to be thinking about, you know. So you want to do a validate scope every so often, you know. But it comes with the stakeholders agreeing that, okay, that's a good way to proceed to ensure that we don't spend tons of money only to have a deliverable that doesn't work for us. So you might want to think about prototyping and, you know, just things that will nip those issues in the bud, especially if it's a very change-driven type of project. So the first thing you want to do is sit down and strategize. How should we best manage risks? Should we meet every week to discuss the current state in the risk report? Ding, ding, ding. Did you catch that word? Risk report. You want, might want to write that down. There's a huge addition of the risk report in the PMBOK guide. PMBOK guide 6th edition now stresses not only do you have your risk register, but you also have your risk report. And you need to know what's in your risk report, folks. So right off the bat in planning, you're asking questions. You're saying, okay, how should we manage this project in such a way that we curtail any risks that could come as a result of us not doing things sensibly? such as regular checks, regular audits, things like that, inspections. So in plan risk management, this is where it's a meeting of the mind to decide how best should we or could we manage risks. This is where you take a look at your, maybe take a look at your current risk probability impact matrix. You know, maybe your probability impact matrix is faulty. Did you weight the impact more than the probability? Or did you make it a 1 to 10 and a 1 to 10? Now, some people do it that way, but a better mousetrap is to weight the impact a little bit more. So this is where you're looking at your risk, you know, your risk documents, things like your probability impact matrix, trying to get the configuration. Maybe it's a 1 to 5 and a 1 to 8 instead of a 1 to 5 and 1 to 5 a 1 to 10 and a 1 to 10, you're changing things. You're optimizing these documents. It's a meeting of the minds. Too many people trying to rush into identifying risks. No, that's not the way to do it. You need to sit down and you really need to strategize the best way. What are the best tools to use? What is our risk breakdown structure going to look like? Have you taken a look at the risk breakdown structure in the PMBOK guide? That's curtsy my buddy, the risk doctor. Take a look at that. And by the way, the risk doctor and I, yeah, 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 shameless plug, but we've got a killer course coming out, and it's coming out in June. So you want to stay tuned to the channel. Those of you who are thinking of taking the RMP exam, you want to be like your buddy Phil, who's taking all sorts of certifications and risk tickles your fancy. By the 15th of June, folks, you want to stay glued to the channel because we've got a killer course coming out. It's really, really awesome. I mean, the risk doctor dropped some gold. I mean, I was scribbling all throughout the whole, you know, the whole thing, even though it was meant to be a two-way street. I was scribbling stuff. That dude is mean. Hey, if you haven't checked out the risk doctor channel on YouTube, you're missing out. Because if you really want to go deep into risk, that's the man. And this course that we have for RMP is going to be killer. Anyway, back to the point of plan risk management. Too many people trying to get into identify risks, but they don't even have the right tools. They don't even have the right risk register configuration. You know, when you are on a project, a new project, a hard project, 
you need to sit down and ask, are these tools sufficient? Is this tracking tool, this risk register, is it good? You know, it's where there's a lot of dialogue, a lot of dialogue, if it's done the right way. You don't just say, oh, we've got this tool from a well-known IT firm that was in competition with another well-known firm that made these. <laughs> you know the firm I'm talking about, but anyway, name withheld. But they've got a tool for tracking risks. It's more than just throwing tools. You know, my, my quote in, in the series has been, great project management is not great because of software tools. You already know that. It's made great because of the great minds, your minds, the great minds and the great attitudes behind the tools. So you can have all the tools till cows come home and still fall flat when it comes to risk. So in plan risk management, I'm really trying to get you into the essence of plan risk management because people want to use it as a drive through. Oh yeah, we need to pay, we need to pay some cash here. There you go. Okay. On to identify a risk where the fun is. No, this is where you need to milk every single drop of your documents for risk. Hey, what about your, your matrix for scoring the risks? The PMI calls it something like definitions of impact scales. So have you defined your impact scale? If someone says, oh, it's a very high, high probability risk, what do they mean by very high? What kind of probability is very high? Is it a 70, an 80, a 90? Have you defined that? If you're using a scale of one to five and someone says, oh, it's from one to five, well, define what a one is. If a one is less than 5% of a schedule increase, then everyone knows if this risk is more than a 5% increase in schedule, then it cannot fall into the very low or whatever the band is. So project managers, I want you to spend some time with your teams really brainstorming and milking all of these documents. Don't just take the risk register that you've got from eons ago and start using it. No, this is where you need to get your team involved. A lot of project managers miss this one. They're trying to do everything on their own. They want to do the schedule on their own. They want to do the risks on their own. They want to do that. No, don't do that. Get the team, the team, the, the, the people working on the project. They would be delighted in most instances, except you've done them wrong. <laughs> or perhaps you've not used one of our favorite leverages, which is recognition and reward. You know, if you use that, I mean, not maliciously, but use it in good faith. I mean, if someone's really done something great, did you commend them for it? Did you give them a pat on the back? Did you tell their boss that they are out of this world? If you haven't been doing that, you know, I want to encourage you, drop gold, drop, hey, drop some reward, right, in the disguise of a thumbs up or a big up to them when you're speaking to their boss. It's one of the quickest ways you can add value to someone who has done a great job on projects in the past. So if you're not pinging people's bosses to tell them, hey, Phil did an awesome job, you know, and from the bottom of your heart, don't make up stuff. But I mean, if it's really true, your team or people in the organization in, you know, it's matrix, they're all in different departments, those folks, they'll show up for you. Payback, you know, influencing without authority, folks. It's all about the payback. You know, it's all about what have you done for me and what can you do for me? That's the mindset. So in risk, what I'm trying to say is if you've been doing good, the team is going to show up to help you in plan risk management. That's really what I'm getting at. And the team, don't underestimate the team. My goodness, humans are amazing. The kind of ideas you can get from your team, just sitting down in a room and brainstorming and using the right tools, maybe using an Ishikawa or using an affinity diagram or whatever tool it is, a mind map, you'll be amazed when people are in the zone, you'll be amazed at the kind of brain power that they're dishing out. 
So what I'm trying to say, in, you know, to cut the long story short, is don't just crank out a risk register and identify risks. Spend some quality time in plan risk management. And you want to come out with a risk management plan that is realistic to your project, you know. So two things. There's an overall strategy for how you manage risk. But then there's an underlying methodology. The strategy is the underlying philosophy in your risk approach. For example, in a well-known semiconductor company, when I worked there, our approach on the project, the program that I was managing, I was actually a project manager for HR and a program manager for the entire thing. But the philosophy that management had espoused was, we need to know the top risks. We need to know when there's fire on that mountain and we need to know now. So it was a mindset of urgency. You know, the, the whole risk strategy was one of urgency. What are the top risks? Those of you who use a four-up report, you know, you know you've got the, the quadrant for risks and what is in there are your top risks, those that can eat your project alive or kill your project. You know what I'm talking about, that kind of stuff. We've got some background noise here all of a sudden. Hang on. It's like a magnetic field. Yeah, okay. All right, we're back. So I was saying the risk strategy versus the methodology are two different things. Your method are all of the tools, all of those ITTOs you're going to use, you know, the, the matrix, the register, all that stuff is part of your method. But your underlying strategy, you know, is, is an overarching philosophy. We need to know the risk fast and management needs to help us get these solved, you see. All of that stuff is what you're thinking about in plan risk management. What is our strategy going to be? And then the method comes next. What tools? And then you're trying to mine for your stakeholder risk tolerances. Your stakeholders may be averse. Some of them might be seeking. There's a line of best fit. You want that line of best fit. And you also want to know which risks are hot buttons for these stakeholders. Some senior stakeholders are averse to a particular type of risk, not risk in general, but they just hear about one type of risk and they go ballistic. So it's in planning risk management, you're trying to get the essence of all of these things. What is our strategy? What is our method? What tools are we going to use? What is our risk probability impact matrix going to look like? And things like that. Now, when you get to the point that you have fleshed out all of the details, your you know, definition of impact scales, your probability and impact, all of that stuff. After you get to the end of that and you have come up with your risk management plan that configures how your register will look, how your RBS will look, then, only then, do you proceed to identify risks. So you can see I've, I've spent 15 minutes talking about plan risk management on its own. 15 minutes, probably even going on 20 minutes, oh my goodness. One process, you see, and this is the level of detail that I have gotten to in the Project Management Audio Digest that's going to hit next week, you see. So if you're looking for audio and stuff to help you beyond this, you want to look out for that. But anyway, the next process after you've got your solid risk management plan you then move into identifying risks. Note of caution, if you are identifying risks with your team, the right thing to do will be to embrace all manner of risks. Whether you think they're good, bad, or ugly, you want to get all of those risks. You want to mine, right? You want to mine those risks. Get all of those risks down, folks. And you know the quickest way to do that? Quickest way, you got a bunch of people, 50 people in a room, 20 people in a room. There's no way you're going to interview each person. You need to use a rapid approach. So you want to get a risk probability impact matrix, a big old one, put it on the board somewhere. 
and have people in the room using a Delphi approach or quasi Delphi approach where people aren't speaking to each other where it's pretty much anonymous and people don't need to write their names and oh this risk is from me you know keep it as anonymous and as low-key as possible and then you'll get some great responses and it's the job of the PM to facilitate this so you'll see in identifying risks you need to have great facilitation skills you see what I'm saying you need to have these great facilitation skills so that you can effectively mine the risks so after you've used these rapid approaches to get all of the risk maybe on a post-it note each person places their post-it notes where their risk score is you know so probability and impact maybe you've got a one to five and a, a one to eight and the, the topmost level there is a 40 as a score everybody places their post-its wherever their risks lie they define them as good as they can the PM takes that and puts it into the register but you also don't want to lose track of the PMI's approach the PMI's model or philosophy so to speak when you are identifying risks you want the cause risk effect model the cause risk effect model you ever heard of that cause risk effect it will minimize the guesswork you know so, so you want a risk but you will also want to identify the root cause and you want to identify the effect you know so take for example risk of someone falling okay someone could fall what could cause it a mop bucket in the way all right is there anything else that could cause it yes there are multiple things that could cause it this is where you really get into the bottom of what could cause that risk to happen maybe a slippery floor maybe someone left a banana skin that would be the cause and then the effect would be broken bones you see the risk is the fall the effect is broken bones and you could keep going down in a cascading way looking for the cascading effects which may ultimately lead to a lawsuit and stuff such as that but the root cause was a banana skin you know so as you identify risks you want that model you know risk but the cause and the effect and that will help your team when they are beginning to think about how can we counteract this risk you know because in identify risks you know PMI slid that one into the PMBOK guide that you can actually do some preliminary risk response strategizing but it's kind of slid in there you, you, you have to really be reading the PMBOK guide to see that so at a high level if someone comes up with a great response you want to harvest that response right then and there you get what I'm saying it's all quiet let's have some music in the background Carlos Santana <laughs> we're gonna have some of that stuff later on okay let me not get carried away let's put it down a little bit all right so in identify risks folks like I said this is where your team is going to be given some leeway to come up with these really great ideas about what could happen cause risk effect put that in the risk register get some preliminary responses for those people who may not be there when you do the plan risk responses process come out with your risk register make sure that your risk register has already been configured with all the fields you need and then you move into perform qualitative risk analysis but wait you've already scored your risks so you killed two birds with one stone because you told your team come out with the ideas of the risk cause risk effect and then go ahead on a big old matrix you know sometimes I just create the matrix when I do workshops for firms I just create the matrix myself on a whiteboard or big old you know those big post-its and then let the team come up and just slap their risk cause effect with their risk score it works wonders and it's quick so all of that stuff is what you're doing qualitative you know there are fine lines dividing these processes in risk 
you know, at one point you might be doing identify and before you know it, you've switched into performing qualitative risk analysis. So in perform qualitative risk analysis, what we want to do is categorize, you know, we want to categorize the risks and then we want to rank the risks. So you're going to do a preliminary ranking, but you're also going to categorize, you know, and those risks that fall to the bottom, you, you keep them in a proverbial, it's not really a watch list, it's the bottom level of the risk register. So anything, for example, if your total score is a 40 and you've got some risks that are fours and threes and twos and ones, you leave them in the watch list. The watch list is not a different document, it's just the lowest level of the risk register. So after you've done that, this is where you then begin to quantitatively assess the risk. So we move into quantitative risk analysis. So in perform quantitative risk analysis, this is where you may use your Monte Carlo. This is where decision tree analysis comes in. And I would encourage you to go to palisade.com. I've said it here on this program a few times. P-A-L-I-S-A-D-E, Palisade. My buddies at Palisade, they'll take care of you as far as the Monte Carlo. They've got some crazy inventions that will help you. They've got at risk for project, at risk for Excel, and all sorts of great stuff. So I would advise you, go check that out, and you'll become very familiar with the whole idea about Monte Carlos and beta distribution and why you should know the distribution type to put into that thing. You know, why should you use triangular? When should you use triangular? All of that stuff. Great coverage. Great coverage. So those of you PMPs, you're a PMP and you, you, you haven't checked out palisade.com, go check it out. You know, it will expand your mind about the possibilities and the capabilities. You know, way back when I worked in a defense firm, there were the guys in the basement, basement, and one of them said, hey, Phil, do you want to come see our risk Monte Carlo analysis? I'm like, no, I don't want to go into the basement. Sounded a little bit foreboding, but that was their job, just doing Monte Carlos, you know, on this big old defense a contract that we were bidding on. So if, if you haven't been exposed into the world of the Monte Carlo you haven't seen these things come to life, Palisade. But anyway, that's perform quantitative risk analysis, okay? And in perform quantitative risk analysis, we also talk about decision tree analysis. Good Lord, what's that page? I can't remember the page. It was $3.99 in the previous PMBOK guide. I think it's is it $4.29 now. Hey, it's that image that has the decision tree. Hey, is any, anyone on this call have you got a PMBOK guide to hand? Because if you if you can open up your PMBOK guide and chat in to us where that thing is, I would really appreciate it. You know, I would really, really appreciate it. Um, where is that decision tree um, thing? You know, the decision tree image in the PMBOK guide. But can't can't remember where it is. But anyway. All of that to say, um, that would be something to look out for on your exam, definitely. Um, on your exam, I can, almost, I can almost bet on it. A number of people are going to get a similar image on the on their exam. But that would be something to look into. Make sure you understand the workings and the formulas and how they did that thing. Um, also, the tornado diagram, that's also one to look out for when it comes to sensitivity analysis, trying to find which risks are the most sensitive. In other words, which risks have the biggest impact, positive or negative, on the project. Take a look at that. Make sure you understand that. But performing quantitative risk analysis is dense. You know, it's, it's huge. And that's why I really recommend some basic knowledge by checking out Palisade, because when you get into the S-curve and the, the Monte Carlo and the decision trees and the probability distributions and so on, it will make sense why you're doing what you're doing and how, you know, where all those things come into play. All right, after quantitative risk analysis, then we get into planning our risk responses. So the PMI have added one new response called escalate. Before we didn't escalate, 
theoretically, even though we did it in the real world, it just wasn't in the PMBOK guide. I mean, anyone escalates, everyone escalates. Even your kids at home escalate. Hey, the, the water's not going off. Hey, that's, that's escalated. And when I talked about you using risk daily, I was talking about driving. Every second you drive, there's a risk. Should I go to the right? There's a nutcase on my right. No. Should I go to the left? There's the slowest snail ever on my left. So let me just stay in my lane. You know, or it could be there's a sandstorm. Should I continue if you're in Arizona? I mean, one of those may have happened to you or somewhere else in, in the U.S. or in the world, right? But the question would be, should I continue plowing down this road or should I move to the right and park? If I park, am I likely to be hit? hit? There was a terrible accident, um, actually a, a pileup a few weeks ago. And it probably all started from someone making the wrong decision. And that's how the pileup happened. So every time we drive, there's always a decision to do something, you know, and it could be a positive risk. It could be a negative. It's sometimes getting off the, the exit before the one you're really going to could save your life. You know, sometimes you see, I mean, in Arizona, this happens a lot. There's a lot of nut cases and they're packing heat. You get into an argument with one of those people, <laughs> you may not be opening the PEMBOK guide again. So anytime I, I get into those conflicts or I'm about to, I tell myself it's not worth it. And I, I just get off on an exit before, you know, anytime you've got a nutcase coming after you. So you, you, you got to ask yourself the same way you do in the real world on your projects, right? Ask the same questions. You know, should we escalate? Should we avoid? Should we mitigate? Should we transfer? And then if you've got a positive risk, you know, for example, two ways to get to a favorite place, maybe taking the B line, literally there's a, a road called the B line here, a highway in Arizona. Should I take the B line or should I go on the 101? And sometimes getting on the B line makes more sense. But if you get on the 101 at a particular time of the day, it's going to be a parking lot. So the same way in our projects, we need to be asking ourselves the same question. Should I do this? Should I avoid? Should I transfer? Should I mitigate? Should I accept? Or positive risk? Should I share? You know, sometimes sharing is the best way to get something from it. But at the same time, you also need to be careful with share. Because share could be shooting oneself in the foot, depending on the risk, is all I'm saying. So in planning your risk responses, you're trying to decide what should we do? Should we do this? Should we do this? Should we do that? All right. After planning your risk responses, you've now seen basically the profile of this thing, how you're going to attack it, how it could, you know, fester. And there's some additional definitions that further categorize risks like manageability, like propinquity, you know, like proximity. All of these terms, check them out in the PEMBOK guide. Because if you found them on the exam, you could get confused if you haven't dug into the difference between all of these terms. There's a bunch of them, so many of them. Also, when you begin to look at these risks, it's, it's also important that you take a look at these prompt lists. You know, there's a bunch of prompt lists that are talked about in this area. You know, you want you want to master your prompt list, like the VUCA or VUCA, they call it, you know, or, or the teacup or the pestle, you know, political, economical, social, technological, legal, environmental, whatever it is. Make sure you know all this stuff, because if you found them on the exam, they could bite you if you don't know them in toto. That would be my suggestion to you, you know, VUCA, volatility and so on. What? What do each of those letters mean? You know, so go on a little hunt there and make sure you know them and the definitions and all of that stuff. Okay, when you're done with planning your risk responses, then you get into implementing your risk responses. But on the exam, the real big thing, folks, in my mind, is not necessarily the implementation of the response. It's strategizing which response is best. So there's a fine line between mitigate versus avoid. Fail is a risk on your project as a resource. 
he has not gone for training in XYZ. There's not enough time to send him for training, but he is a resource that you need, at least you think. So what should you do? Should you avoid by getting him off the project? Will that solve the problem? Or should you mitigate by having someone shadow him? You see what I'm saying? Avoid would be yanking him off, problem solved. Mitigate would be minimizing the possibility or the impact of the risk. So for each of those, mitigate, avoid, transfer, accept, escalate, know the subtleties. The one that really confuses people on the side of the positive risk is usually the exploit versus enhance. Just go with what the PMI is telling you. Exploit is the opposite of avoid, but on the positive side. If you are exploiting something, you are putting your best foot forward, you're throwing the whole load of ammo on that thing, all the resources, everyone, all hands on deck to maximize that risk, to make sure that it really does happen. That is exploit. You are eliminating the possibility of the risk not occurring. So you're eliminating anything that could prevent the occurrence of the risk. That's exploit. It's a very strong word. But enhance will be increasing the likelihood of a positive risk or the impact. And the PMI give examples in the um, PMBOK Guide 6th edition. Check those out. So we've talked about plan risk responses, implement risk responses, and now we're on to monitor risks. The PMI changed that from control, so we're now in monitor. Now, by the time you get to monitor risks, now the PMI say, no, you can't control risks. You wish you could, but you can't. So they, they change that to monitor risk. I remember way back when it was once called monitor and control risks, then it was called control risks. Now it's called monitor risks. So in monitor risks, you are checking, you know, that's really what you're doing. It's a checkup. It's a checkup to make sure that the risks have not become worse, you know, that the risks are right where you left them and that things aren't going to become worse than they are, you know. So anyway, in monitor risks, you're going to end up getting a lot of updates, project documents updates. Your risk register is going to be updated. Your risk report, those are the two biggies. Risk register, risk report. You're going to find a lot of those updates, folks. So anyway, we've come to the end of our review of risk management. I hope that helped you. And it's time for some music.